All right, hello everyone, and welcome to uh, day two uh, of uh, Snoofer. I guess you already heard your introduction from uh, from Friedemann. Um, this is the first talk of the day. It's from Vika Pevand, who's an assistant professor at uh, INI, and she's going to talk to us uh, about analog stuff to do with uh, implementing neuromorphic things with analog substrates. Anyway, I'll, I'll leave her to talk about that. Thank you very much. Go for it. Thank you, Dan. Let me see if this works, hopefully. OK. Yes, we're seeing the screen. All good. Yep. All right. Great. OK. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Thanks for, for joining the session. Thank you guys for inviting me uh, and for your effort in this amazing annual event uh, for spiking that. So I'm going to be talking about um, analog uh, substrates for, for efficient implementation of SNN accelerators, um, taking advantage of um, the temporal dimension and, the, and their locality. Um, so the problem of efficient neural network uh, hardware, um, it's, a, it's an important problem, of course. And the, the problem generally stems from the fact that the MAC operation which is the multiply and accumulate operation at the core of all neural network operations, requires fetching uh, large weight matrices from the memory. So in, in current um, hardware architecture, the, the processing unit and the memory are separated. And then in order to do computation, we fetch instructions and the data from the memory, bring it to the, to the processing unit, um, and then uh, do computation. Now, if you have to do this a lot, because, because of this uh, max data movement bet between the memory and the processing unit. And um, in, in the modern hardware architecture or hardware systems, we have this hierarchy of memory because different memories have different properties. And as you go further away from this, uh, from this processor, the energy to read and access the memory becomes more uh, becomes more expensive. Um, so, as a result, uh, in order to solve this problem, people are working on uh, bringing the memory and computation closer to each other, or ideally on each other, uh, which is this concept of in-memory computing, which minimizes the data movement. So this usually uh, means that in these kind of in-memory uh, computing architecture, you have what is uh, known as a crossbar memory, where inputs are given to the rows, outputs are taken out from the columns, and at the intersection of these rows and columns, you have memory devices that uh, store the, the parameters of the of your neural network. Um, now. This means that then you have uh, local computation because then you no longer have to go and fetch data from anywhere. Uh, data is recited where you want to do the computation, where the input arrives and, and output is taken out. And um, there are different types of memories that could be used for, uh, for these type of in-memory computing. You can, you, you can use a variety of memories. But in this talk, I'm going to be talking about using resistive memory um, as the as the memory element that is used to store the, the parameters of the of the network. Now, what is this resistive memory? So uh, resistive memory is um, resistant random access. So you, I, I refer to that as RM. Uh, these are non-volatile reprogrammable resistors. Um, which switch between an off state where the resistance of the of this device is high, so it's a high resistive state or HRS, um, uh, or, and it switches, it can switch through a set operation to an on state, which is a low resistive state um, uh, or LRS. So between with a with a set and a restart operation, we go from an off state to an on on state. Um, and these devices usually have a small footprint, so they can also be 3D integrated on top of the silicon technology. And um, silicon is what costs, the, the, the silicon real estate is what costs a lot in, in 
in all the memory. So that's what you want to save. And the fact that you can go 3D helps in reducing this, uh, this real state. And they usually store multiple bits of information. So it's not like, a, um, so unlike digital memory, which usually has only a, a one bit of information, so it's either off or on, you can, you can have a spectrum of values between this uh, on and off state. Um, now, why is this efficient? By the way, I, I, I forgot to say that in all of these slides, wherever you see a green highlight, it's referring to a concept of efficiency. And where, where you see a blue uh, highlight, it's, it's referring to, to an analog implementation. So the efficiency through RM is, is uh, because, of, because of multiple things. One is because it's, um, it has a low static power consumption. It means that you can, um, uh, while, that, while there is no input to the system, this is not drawing any, any power, which is, which is usually, uh, and now with the low tech, with like more advanced technology knows this is uh, what is taking a, a, a large uh, amount of power consumption in, in the systems. And in order to reduce this, what people do is what is known as power gating. So they gate, they turn off parts of the chip and this is also a concept called dark silicon. So there, there's so much static power that they just turn off parts of the chip in order to not have any uh, static power consumption running. And then when you when they turn it on, then you you would have to re reload all the parameters of the of uh, all the parameters and on memory that you have back to the memory. So the fact that it's non volatile it hel helps with reducing this um, static power uh, consumption and re and reloading the memory. Um, another interesting thing about them is that um, they do this Mac operation through, the, through their physics. So um, the input is, is mapped to the, to the voltage uh, as, an, as an input to this, this crossbar array. The, the weights are mapped to the conductance. And then through a, a, a physical law called the Ohm's law, uh, you get a current which is the multiplication of the voltage times conductance, um, and it performs the multiplication. And then these currents sum together through Kirchhoff's law, and that gives rise to the sum of the multiplication, which is the, um, which is the MAC operation. Now, for spiking net networks, these are interesting because the, the access time, so the time it takes to read the memory, and the time it takes to write into the memory is, is low, is in the order of tens of nanoseconds. And as a result, they are a good match for, for inference and learning with, with SNN. So in the case of SNNs, uh, instead of um, we translate the, the inputs to the time of the arrival of a spike, um, a pulse, and the pulse a height is basically a, a voltage with which we can read the device, called, we call that a read voltage. Um, and then they, uh, what the Ohm's law and the Kirchhoff's law do then is that you, you get a current equivalent or, uh, to, the conduct, uh, uh, to the read voltage times the conductance, so proportional to the conductance at the time um, of the input. So you get, you get the, these currents at different times. And then they sum together, so then you sum over space and time. And the key to this is then temporal computation. So we talked about locality and the temporal computation. Now, these RMs have a certain characteristics. So, and these characteristics show heterogeneity. So these are measurements that you can see from statistical measurements from uh, arrays of around 16 kilobits. And uh, you can see this is the cumulative distributed function on the y-axis, on the x-axis you see resistance. Um, and uh, so you can see that we can get um, an a spectrum of resisted values, which is analog, but there is also a, a, a lot of variability. So you see in the low resistance state, which is high conductance, you can get these kind of eight uh, distributions, uh, which means that on average, when you program these devices, you can find them on, on, eight, on, on eight states. And, but, these, but this is on average, and generally there's a lot of variability. And the variability, so if you look at the change of conductance over G, so this is basically sigma over mu, 
um, is much larger in the high resistive state than it is in the low resistive state. And as a matter of fact, so on the x-axis you see programming current, you, we can control the state of the device in the low resistive state uh, a lot better than in the high resistive state because in the uh, because of the physical properties that the device has and it's uh, and the details of that is outside of the, the scope of this talk um so the type of distributions are probably the distribution functions that you get in the lrs and hrs so in the low resistive state there basically you get like these eight uh, these eight states or so these eight Gaussian distributions and in the high resistive state you get a log normal so this is a log uh, on the x-axis here is the log uh, log of resistance and you can see that in in the log axis it looks uh, like a normal distribution so it's a it, it follows a log normal distribution so now the, the question becomes um, how can we um, do this temporal and local based uh, lo local spike based computation with what we get from these um, RMs. So first, um, I'll talk about the, the temporal part, and then I'll switch to the local part. So uh, the key to computing with SNNs is time, we, we all know. Um, and delays are temporal variables that are a good match with, with uh, spiking networks. So if we want to now think of this in terms of crossbar arrays, so, um, like I said, inputs arrive to to uh, to the rows. Outputs are taken from the columns, and instead of just having now one one weight value, we can also have a delay value. So each synaptic parameter now becomes a delay and a and a weight value, and then these are these delays are then extra set of variables that that can enrich the complexity of the network. And as a matter of fact, in the past few months there has been a lot of um, interest in the uh, in using these kind of delay based networks I, I think after this talk we will hear about uh, one of the works actually um, and the interesting uh, thing about them is that these delayed ne networks enable higher accuracy than vanilla RNN with the same number of parameters so this is um, uh, has been collected from the literature and it's uh, benchmarking on the spiking Heidelberg brick digit, which is the speech uh, um, speech classification task on uh, 20 classes of spoken digits. On the y-axis is the text, test accuracy and the x-axis you see number of parameters. Green is the delay-based networks and, and black are the recurrent ones. And you can see that for the same number of parameters, the delay-based networks um, are showing a trend on uh, having high, higher accuracy. So how, since this, this is, you know, these delay-based networks have lower number of parameters, there are um, better, of course, for the hardware because, because memory is expensive. Um, so now we're going to try to go and implement this with resistive memory. So um, one of these synapses which have a delay and a weight then can be implemented potentially like this. So the, the delay parameter would be this RC value, which is a, a delay RM with a, in parallel with a capacitor. Um, and then the weight um, RM will, will, have a, will be representing uh, the weight RM. So now, um, instead of just having one, one RM, you, we have two RMs with a, with a capacitor. Um, so how this is supposed to work, is that now when an input arrives here to the gate of this um, transistor, it will close this transistor and um, it will discharge this capacitor. And as soon as this uh, pulse then goes away, this capacitor discharges through this uh, resistance. Um, so this R RDC time constant is what gives rise to this delay. And then this delayed spike will then get up applied to the, to the gate of this transistor. And the, the weight RM will then uh, decide how much current will be passing through this branch. So uh, in this case, instead of implementing delays through uh, actively keeping memory in buffers, which, which requires uh, power, we can save this in a non-volatile manner in the, in the resistive memory using passive RC circuits. And this will then be a fundamental building block for, for uh, 
um, analog SNN hardware uh, where we can move the spikes both in the X and the Y dimension. Um, so now what is what what can this be good for? Um, so we can uh, so we we use we're you know you, we would like to use this for kind of edge applications uh, for online sensory processing um, where the, the time scale of this uh, um, of these sensory sensory signals are in the order of tens to hundreds of milli milliseconds and therefore the the time scale of these delays should kind of match with the with the average time scale of, of these uh, of these signals this means that um, if you want to have tens of milliseconds or hundreds of milliseconds of time scale and you do not want to have large capacitors which usually take a lot of uh, space on on uh, on systems on chips you would like to have um, the delays in the high resistance state regime and uh, then weights can be programmed between high resistance state and low resistance state so you want to have high resistance but um, if you remember, I told you that the, the high resistance state has a lot of variability um, and is not very well controlled. Um, so, uh, and for now, so the technology is limited for, for controlling high resistance state. So, so we have to figure out a way of, of training networks that take, in, take this into account. And that brings me to the, this RM aware training of these delay based networks. These are um, some measurements that um, Simone D'Agostino is a PhD student at Saletti actually. Um, so did with the with the chip that we implemented these these delays. So you can see the log normal distribution here of this uh, of this delays which are implemented with high resistance state. And what we do what we can do is to uh, is to assume an initial condition for the delays that are that are sampled from this distribution. So as, as soon as we we reset the devices, they're going to end up uh, being somewhere in this distribution. Um, so then we have like heterogeneous delays. So we're exploiting this heterogeneity. And then we can train uh, the spiking net uh, to pick the, the, the correct uh, weights, um, uh, the correct delays. So train the weights to pick the right delays with the right amount. To, to solve the, the task at hand. And since Dan is, is, is chairing the session, I couldn't resist uh, of putting this um, reference to, to a paper that uh, they published two years ago on NatureCom, uh, which showed that the neural heterogeneity promotes, promotes robust, robust learning. And this is a, a sentence from, from the abstract where they say they compared the performance of spiking nets to carry out a task of real world difficulty with various degrees of heterogeneity. And they found that the heterogeneity substantially um, improved the task performance. Of course, in this case, this remains to be studied in our case, but nevertheless, I wanted to bring uh, this reference that um, potentially this heterogeneity could bring uh, more robustness to the learning. So um, other than the delays that are now uh, constant and no, no, no. We want to train the weights, and we have to make sure that the uh, whatever we train is then mappable to these analog memristors, uh, which have a certain um, conductance through which they uh, they operate, and they have a certain amount of noise. Um, so for that, um, so Filippo and Yeet, um, they use this uh, straight through estimator function, which is a similar idea to quantization over training where we have noisy memristive weights for inference and, uh, and then weight update on the original per, un, unperturbed weights. So we, um, in, we assume about 10 to 20% margin to any values between the min, min and the max. And that margin comes from the fact that um, when you want to program resistive memory and you're in the off state, you basically take, take a target. You say, I want to go to this conductance. And that target is, is within a margin of a low conductance and high conductance because you cannot get exactly the value you want. It's not a FP32 weight. Um, so you do the programming, you apply the pulse, then you read and you see if the conductance that you want is, is within that window. And if, if it is, then, then you're good. If not, then you have to reset and, and redo this. So this is what is called the read and verify uh, iterative programming. 
uh, which the weight, depending on this window, so you can try to close this window, you can even get to 5% if you really want to keep programming and reading, but you don't want to, if you want to reduce the, the number of programming times, you can assume about 10 to 10 or really maximum 20%. Um, if you're interested, Filippo wrote a, a Medium post on this Member Story Aware training, um, uh, which is uh, which he has collected a bunch of ideas that 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 do exist uh, in the field. Um, so now uh, we did some. We are actually currently working on this um, RM Aware training of feed for feed forward neural nets. Uh, with delays on on a temporal task, and we've picked um, the spiking Heidelberg digit. Like I mentioned, is a is a data set that actually Friedemann uh, collected together with the Heidelberg uh, colleagues, and it's twenty classes spoken digits between zero to nine German in English. The network architecture is a feed forward architecture, picking sixty four input channels. So the data set has seven hundred, but we're picking sixty four. If we have n number of delays per, per channel and 20 outputs with 20% noise of members and a mean delay of 500 milliseconds, this is um, the plot you can see. On the y-axis, you get test accuracy. On the x-axis is the number of delays per channel. Um, and uh, here you can see that as the number of delays increases, um, you you get higher accuracy, you get around 70% for 16 delays per, per channel. Um, so just to give you a reference, four number of four delays per channel is 5K trainable parameters with a 10, uh, 10K total parameters with the delays and weights. And just remember that we're not training the delays here. And 16 uh, number of delays is 20K tra trainable parameters. Um, so this is ongoing work. Actually, Tristan is uh, getting very exciting results. So stay tuned uh, for the for the for the rest. Um, so now I switch to the second part, which is on locality um, and doing so local computation now with analog RM. So we were talking about IMC, new memory computing, which is local, and that kind of solves this problem of data shuttling between the memory and processor. But there's a limit. And the limit comes from the fact that you cannot make this memory as large as you want uh, because there are physical limits in terms of uh, resistances that are on, the, on, the, on these lines, in terms of capacitances that are, that are on the lines. Um, and the fact that um, if you have an off state of resistive memory, um, it is not, uh, and that receives an input, an input pulse, the current you you still get some current. Your current is not zero because it's it's a it's an off resistance in the order of you know tens of mega ohms, but you you will still get some some current. So Jun Ren is a, a PhD student uh, here at INI done some has done some nice analysis on the scaling of the crossbar arrays based on these parasitic resistance and the ratio between R on and R off, um, and has plotted the a sensitivity margin in order for us to still be able to detect. So, so an RM has um, an analog um, number of states. And in order for us to be able to sense uh, the difference and, and resolve this uh, different states, we need to have high sensitivity. So ideally, you want to have, have a high a sensitivity of one. But as the number of um, rows and columns increases in the crossbar, your sensitivity drops depending on the R on R off ratio. Um, also, as you move to more advanced technology nodes, uh, from, for example, 180 nanometer to 22 nanometer, the resistivity of the metal lines becomes higher because, because you have now a small, smaller uh, diameter, and that smaller diameter increases the resistivity. Um, and uh, that contributes to the to to how large you can make this crossbar arrays. So then now we are back to the same problem that uh, we can only have a small crossbar. And um, if you want to scale these networks, now you have to go to multiple crossbars. And uh, that 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 becomes uh, back back to the problem of data movement. So how how can we scale these IMCs while staying local? 
So usually people go to this multi-core architecture, and that's also uh, what we would like to do. So now you have these um, small small crossbars that that um, their size is suitable for um, uh, you know the resistivity and the and the R on R off ratio. And if you now, uh, so we we, side, we we keep the size small, small, and if now these crossbars want to talk to each other, um, we introduce routers between them, and these routers can also be small routing crossbars that are also made with uh, resistive memory, and we call this the mosaic architecture. So this is um, this gives rise to a distributed uh, small and local routing. Um, where each, uh, which where the the computing crossbars are now um, basically a crossbar array with spiking neurons, and the routing crossbars are uh, crossbars that uh, navigate the the spikes through this uh, computing mesh. So um, how it works is that now the state of the, the memory devices inside this computing cores tells you how to compute. So an input, sorry, inputs arrive to this, they they get weighted and they get, uh, and the, the neurons will integrate it and spike. And then the spikes are then sent to the neighboring routers and the state of the resistive memory inside inside these uh, routers will decide how this, um, how this information then flows into this uh, systolic array. Um, so you can implement uh, these uh, uh, com computing nodes through basically lift neurons. So it's, this will be an array of memristors that we read from through these readout circuitries. We, we create this um, analog circuits that gives rise to um, exponential currents, uh, implementing uh, excitatory postsynaptic currents. And, and then a silicon-based lift neuron. Um, so that's, that's the usual crossbar array. But then the routing nodes can also be a similar concept, except that instead of integrating the, the spikes that arrive and then firing, we, we, and any time a spike arrives, uh, it creates a current through the conductance, which is either on or off. And if this current is less than a th threshold value or reference reference current, we do not pass the spike. So the spike is not regenerated. But if it's higher, the spike gets regenerated. So every time it goes to a routing node, depending on the state of the device, the, the pulse either gets regenerated and propagated or it just gets blocked. And um, implementing this now, uh, gives rise to this um, computing um, fabric that that implements small world connectivity very well, because uh, now you have these uh, memory devices inside these routers that are keep that are storing the connectivity of the of the network, um, and but but since um, since since this is very local. It encourages local connectivity between between neighboring nodes, and as a result, gives rise to a small world connectivity, which is also a solution that is fi found by by biology. This is uh, from from Balmer and Sporn. This is the fMRI from um, co fMRI connectivity uh, connectivity matrix from different brain regions, where the, where most of the connections are are kept local, and there are very sparse global connectivity. Um, so this local routing has advantages both in terms of minimizing wiring or in local communication, uh, which results in a lower memory footprint. So here I'm showing you the number of required memory element for a small, small world graph um, as a function of the neurons that we have inside these uh, green neuron tiles. And the, the dashed line is the line where uh, if we had a full crossbar array, that's the number of memory elements we would have required. Um, and then the, the other one is the number of memory elements required for, um, for the mosaic architecture for different number of neurons per, 
uh, in the network. Um, so this is basically the aligned uh, uh, or this cross is where uh, beyond which the, the mosaic architecture becomes um, uh, favorable in terms of memory footprint. Um, and also uh, in terms of energy, uh, we have we have a big advantage compared to different um, uh, spike routing architectures, um, both in zero hop energy and one hop energy. So zero hop energy means you have created a, an event and now you want to um, spread this event around. So you can either send it back to the core itself, which is which you're not hopping, the, the spike is coming back to, to the core itself. And one hop means you you're just going to go through one router to go to the to the next um, to the to the next core. Um, now the advantage that the mosaic has is not very surprising, because first of all, most of these uh, uh, other neuromorphic chips have been uh, optimized for maximizing connectivity because they are research platforms that they want to give to people to try many different models. Uh, so they have not been trying to optimize, uh, you know, reducing re reducing the connectivity, um, and also they have cent usually have centralized memory for for storing the connectivity. And in this case, we have a distributed routing uh, uh, architecture where each of these crossbars are very small. So every time you're like reading from, you know, a 32 by 32, 64 by 64 small array. And as a result, it's not very surprising that this gives rise to um, low energy footprint. Um, but then you might now say that, um, of course, uh, when you constrain the connectivity, okay, that there, it comes with advantage in terms of memory and, and energy, but, um, but now you can constrain the, the performance of the network. Um, so Yigit, um found a way of doing uh, this type of layout aware training of taking into account this architecture of, of the mosaic in order to uh, boost the performance of the small world uh, connectivity network. So other than the layout of words, so other than the constraint, the connectivity, also inputs and outputs. So this is a systolic array, which means that inputs arrive from, from one side and outputs get out from another side. And inputs cannot, are not projected to the entire, uh, entire layer and outputs are not taken from, from everyone. So the inputs are projected to the part of the network and output is, is taken out from, from another part. And this should all be taken into account um, in during training. Um, so this in this layout of word training, the non-local connections are penalized through uh, adding a term in the loss function, which is this um, LM, which is the a mask. And this mask is 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 basically um, um, element-wise multiplication of the um, uh, weight square of the weights times this um, S. Which is which is the mask, and the mask uh, is basically an exponentially decaying function, uh, depending on the uh, on the distance between two neurons. So h is the hop. So if you take two two neurons in two different cores, they have a certain number of hops between between them, and we want to encourage local connectivity. So we want to have an exponentially um, exponentially penalizing connections that are f f uh, f further away from each other. And that is, that is now introduced uh, in the loss so that uh, the final connectivity matrix um, is encouraged to be um, local. And then, of course, you have the RM aware uh, training on top of that, like, like the previous case. So he has tried this on, on three tasks. Or one is a simple anomaly detection task, which is a binary classification problem, just to say if the heartbeat is an, uh, abnormal or not. Second one is the, the spiking Heidelberg digit. And this, the third one is a, a half cheetah reinforcement learning for, uh, for motor control. Um, so comparing three networks, so one is the a vanilla RNN uh, with no constraints whatsoever, neither in the in the weights nor in the connectivity. The green um, is the mosaic architecture connectivity with the floating point 32. 
And the, the last one, the blue, is taking into, into account also the noise of resistive memory. Um, so here you see the results. Um, for the ECG task, so the, the red is, is, is always in all of these plots, the, the vanilla RNN. Um, and you can see that although the mosaic architecture has um, constraint in terms of connectivity and of course also in the noise of resistive memory, um, the, the drop in accuracy is not um, disastrous, at least. It's, uh, it's uh, reasonable. And uh, but it comes with the advantages in terms of uh, memory and energy, like I mentioned. So I just uh, conclude the talk here. So I just propose two architectural solutions for fully analog implementation of SNN accelerators. Delays reduce the number of parameters, so it's good to implement them. We implemented them with resistive memory, and we're exploiting the heterogeneity for delay distribution. And we're also enforcing this local communication not only through memory computing, but also now through memory routing, um, which is both energy and memory efficient. And we, and for that, we had to introduce layout aware training to um, uh, to take into account this constraint connectivity while training the network. So I just uh, want to acknowledge the amazing people I work with, the uh, great students and postdocs, and my amazing collaborators from Leti. And thank you for your attention. I am happy to answer any questions. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Um, so we've got quite a few questions, actually. Um, let me let me kick off with the one that's got the most votes here, which is from uh, Rory. And he says that neural systems in biology are robust to fluctuations of substrate properties like temperature and pH via homeostasis. Um, does the RAM have similar substrate level fluctuations? And if so, do they need to be managed at the neural level? Um, yeah, that's what I was talking about, I guess. I mean, they, uh, they are, so RM devices have this, uh, have a lot of fluctuations. Um, so both, so what I have shown here is the fluctuations in programming. So while, while you're programming, you have these kind of distributions, which are basically programming noise. But while you're also reading them, they also have read noise, which is which is much smaller than the programming noise. Um, that is usually much harder to take into account because it's it's something uh, completely unexpected, um, and is is not is basically read noise. So that that's usually not what we take into account. But it's much much smaller. Um, does that does that read noise? Is it is it like random each time, or is it something that might call the random noise. random telegraph noise? Yeah, it's called, it's called the random telegraph noise. It is, uh, it's, it, it basically, it just fluctuates by like 1% or less okay. yeah. around the value. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so the other sorts of noise, so this is, this was my question actually, combining it with Rory's question. Are, are there things that have like slower fluctuations that you have to deal with or anything like that? So there's there's drift. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so actually when you program the devices, um they don't look like this. They actually so right after programming they have much smaller, like narrower distributions, and then you wait like a minute and then they kind of relax to these kind of uh, more overlapping distributions. So in order to get away from that, while we're doing this iterative programming uh you can wait so read the the value of these systems after you know a minute or so and then use that value and then again to to reprogram the the devices so um uh, there is there is drift uh some are at a shorter time scale like a like around a minute or so so that that you can take into account during programming but there, there's also drift at a much longer time scale. So there's some volatility. And that is, that is usually predictable. So that's something you can take into account during programming. Um, so for example, phase change memory is very, uh, so the ones I have talked about are more uh, filamentary based devices. This is very um, maybe technical. So there's phase change memory that is really known uh, to have this drift, which is, 
So the device is in this um, amorphous state and is really unhappy because of the because of the energy because of the energy state it is in. So it just starts to drift um, in like you know minutes time scale to a higher value. So that is usually something that is though char characterized. So then you can model that when you want to uh, train your network. Mm. Do you think that's sorry? I'm, I'm I'm riffing here, but do you think that's related to like representational drift that you see in the brain, or like <laughs> you might well, need similar? Uh, by by related to, I mean, do you think you might need similar like? different algorithms to work in a robust way given that that drift is happening or i don't know if they have the same mechanism i have i have no idea dan you you know better what works in the happens in the brain i have no idea i don't think anyone really knows how I, <laughs> it's a big problem that i think we haven't quite figured out yet but... yeah i think that the drift of pcm is much well known then <laughs> happens in the brain yes i don't know okay all right i'll, I'll move to someone uh, to another question from someone who isn't me um, so Tim Maskelia asks, um, so the crossbar array can be used easily to implement a fully connected layer. What about a convolutional one? So um, for convolutional ones, people have also worked on, I mean, it's it's basically like like any other any other accelerator, right? So the the the, the thing about convolution is that you can with 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 this kind of IMC, is that you cannot do weight sharing, right? So you're you you so so in usual accelerators, they read the weight, they they bring it to to some you know um, uh, buffers, so local buffers, and then they do they reuse the weights as much as they can, and then they go read another uh, another kernel and then bring it and then they do. So with the I am with the in memory computing, indeed the problem is that when when you fixed when you fix the kernel, the kernel is 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 always there. That you would have to reprogram uh, reprogram the kernel. There are people who who are doing that, but I'm not I, I'm not certain if there is necessarily or there has to be a study if if there is a advantage in doing this kind of fixed cur fixed uh, kernel with IMC compared to um, doing weight sharing. Okay, great. All right, I think we're out of time, unfortunately. There's a ton more questions. So maybe if people can ask their questions in the in the chat in the next session, you could maybe answer some of the questions. And uh, uh, yeah, but great talk. Thank you so much. That was really interesting mm -hmm. stuff. Um, and yeah, for everyone, because Crowdcast is playing up a little bit, if you don't get dragged automatically into the next talk, please move yourself into the next session because it will start in, in like one minute. Okay, all right. See you in one second. <laughs>